So again, we come back and revisit the definition we have of pulmonary hypertension, which I have to say, just like uh, uh, Dr. Mayer said yesterday, I, I belong to the category of people that uh, uh, prefer a definition that perhaps starts with pulmonary vascular resistance and then figures out the rest of the cost associated with treating the patient, as opposed to a definition that starts with uh, pulmonary pressures and then tries to qualify it to sort of get out of scenarios where there's high cardiac output or left-sided failure. But by now we're familiar with this set of definition and so still any treatment of pulmonary hypertension and COPD still requires us to follow these, this definition which means that pulmonary hypertension has to exist, the pressures have to be over, uh, mean pressures have to be over 25 at least. Um, that it should not come from the left side of the heart, uh, so the wedge pressure has to be, or pulmonary occlusion pressures have to be less than 15 or equal, and for there to actually be pulmonary vascular resistance, so at least over three woods units. And interestingly, um, and we've seen this before, also the classification, um, that definition, catheter sort of requirements of pulmonary hypertension, only tells you if there is pulmonary hypertension and if it is heart-related or not, so venous or not, it doesn't distinguish between group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension, group three, lung disease-related pulmonary hypertension, and even group four, or five, for that matter. So again, one of the most important things to consider about treatments of pulmonary hypertension and COPD has to do with definitions. Now we're running against two problems with definition. One is what is pulmonary hypertension, and two, what is COPD? Again, there's no great agreement on how these things should be named um, or considered. So we know that people with COPD don't necessarily have normal pressures, it sort of makes sense. A lot of them have a mean pulmonary artery pressure that's slightly above average. Uh, majority over 20. But on the other hand, and here's the interesting part, the portion of COPD patients that have truly severe pulmonary hypertension with really elevated pressure is actually kind of rare. And that may be surprising, but that is the case. So most of the patients uh, with pH in COPD have pressures ranging between 20 and 35. So some fall in the abnormal category but there is a subgroup that truly has significantly elevated pressures. And that group in particular is a subject of our attention. So what would be the pathophysiology of pulmonary hypertension and COPD in addition to the pathophysiology that we see in pulmonary arterial hypertension? Well, it turns out that, and we've seen this with CTEF as well, that the end stage, and perhaps this is like pulmonary fibrosis, the end stage of um, all of our subdivisions end up with endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, and pulmonary vascular remodeling, the last two on the list. But of interest is with COPD, in addition, you have the contribution of hypoxia. We know that hypoxia by itself causes vasoconstriction, and hence the use of oxygen, uh, that really helps our patients. We know that happens in altitude. Uh, we know that happens in, with pneumonia or other uh, local injuries where the lung actually closes off physiologically certain areas. We know that other features such as acidemia, which is a feature of COPD, can cause also uh, focal vasoconstriction. And in addition, you're also victim of local pressures in COPD. There's air trapping and, as a result, dynamic or focal hyperinflation. And that pressure does constrict capillaries, as we're going to see an example pretty soon, and could change the local environment. So there's a lot of different things that, in addition to the vascular remodeling and then to whom this function can be at play. In addition, there is parenchymal destruction with severe emphysema, bolus disease or others, there is a destruction and disappearance of the lung. And so naturally, when there is no pulmonary vasculature, you could imagine that 
um, there will be increased uh, resistance. So let's think about this. My clicker has stopped working. Can I, uh, can we go back? Oh, there you go. So basically, um, pulmonary hypertension, even though the word hypertension has to do with pressure, is really a disease of pulmonary vascular resistance and right ventricular dysfunction. And so there's some physiologic changes and some pathophysiologic changes. We talked about physiologic changes of hypoxia, which are actually beneficial. So in hypoxia, there is constriction. Pathophysiologically, it is possible that when people go to altitude or when some area of the lung, perhaps even in CTEF, this may happen, there is hypoxia and constriction, that there is a penumbra effect and extravascular beds get mistakenly recruited to um, get constricted. And vascular remodeling, that happens perhaps with it. Destruction, as we discussed, that could happen. But also hyperinflation, as we discussed, and acidemia. So now if you look at this picture, are drugs, well, they I'm having a delay with the our drugs are not beneficial uh, our drugs are beneficial in the pathophysiologic portion of it because we know that they deal with vascular remodeling they are ineffective have no effect with destruction hyperinflation and acidemia and they may be conceivably harmful when it comes to dealing with hypoxia. So here we are in a setup trying to use our drugs in um, COPD, but in sort of two, in one case, we're actually not beneficial. In one case, we are detrimental. And only in one case, we're, we're um, um, beneficial. So the cards are not stacked in our favor in the use of our drugs in COPD partly because the pathophysiology of the disease is more complicated, perhaps, than in pulmonary hypertension. So, just to look at the sort of the effect of morphology, um, in this work by, uh, by another Rahagi, you can see that in lung volume reduction surgery, after the valves were placed, and now um, um, Nick and uh, Dr. Washko's group are, are looking at pulmonary vasculature and they've developed uh, algorithms to look at the um, uh, vascular bed uh, before and after um, various interventions. So in this case, endoscopic lung volume reduction. And you can see here that, and if you look at the picture of the vascular bed on top towards the right, that's after procedure, you can see that it's much healthier. And this is, this is by no intervention in the lower lobes. This is by reducing the volume of the top part of the lung. So this is exactly what we actually hoped would happen, which is the areas in the base of the lung that are sort of compressed would actually decompress and start having flow. So you can imagine that this may result in a better vascular flow of the lung. So this is sort of one of the illustrations of what can happen in the COPD that is actually outside just the realm of vascular dysfunction and has to do with simple mechanics of the disease. By the way, it is actually maybe in this form of analysis that the future of pulmonary hypertension and COPD resides because then we can perhaps analyze individual lungs and try to understand them better at a vascular level and predict if they would actually benefit from our treatments. Regardless of the disease, when pulmonary hypertension shows up, mortality gets worse. And that is the case also with um, COPD. So as you saw in that slide, um, which I don't see anymore, um, uh, if the pulmonary hypertension occurs, um, we can see that the mortality rate increases uh, significantly.
I'm sorry, we need to go back a few slides. Can I have previous slide, please? This is not working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So anyway, so pulmonary mm -hmm. hypertension, um, when it appears in COPD, uh, the mortality increases significantly. Go further back. Further back, further back. There we go. Can I have next slide? So when it comes to Reveal and COPD, Reveal was a registry um, that was basically um, looking at uh, uh, U.S. centers, small and large, um, in group uh, one patients. And it turns out that um, there is a leak of COPD patients within group one, whether it is in our registries, whether it is in our trials, and in fact, there is a whole bunch of COPD patients with FEV1s in the range of um, 69 on average that was in that group, and they were still considered group one. So essentially, uh, the investigators considered the COPD coincidental to the pulmonary arterial hypertension and did not classify these patients as group three. And they were pretty much scattered among congenital, um, uh, associated idiopathic um, pulmonary hypertension patients. But regardless, as we've seen in the past, when pulmonary hypertension was associated with COPD, um, their neurocard association functional class was higher and their six minute walk test was lower, 304 versus 400 meters, and their survival, three year survival rate was also uh, lower. So for one thing, we know that COPD has existed and we've seen patients in trials, in fact, with COPD. Next slide. In this French group experience of hemodynamics in patients that were referred for transplant and lumbar heme reduction surgery, you can clearly see that majority of COPD patients fall below the 35 line of pressure. There's two subgroups that slightly come up. A major subgroup, which is here qualified as group four in the corner, has a special hemodynamic in that they don't have that bad of an FEV1, but they really have significant pulmonary hypertension. So we think that that group may be really the target subgroup. Alternatively, another way of looking at it is everybody who's above the threshold of 35 has significant pulmonary hypertension, and maybe those are the people we should pay attention to. But as you can see, there is a lot of people who have mild degree of pulmonary hypertension, and conversely, again, severe pulmonary hypertension is rare. Next slide. So what about pH treatments and COPD? Next slide, please. So let's take the case of sildenafil. In this particular study, uh, six patients were taken, um, FEV1 of less than 50%, so some degree of COPD, uh, severe, moderately severe to severe. Uh, patients with 30-pack year history, pulmonary arterial uh, pressure uh, of over 40, so kind of high pressures. Next slide. And this is one hour post use of sildenafil, and you can see the uh, the pulmonary pressures really responded to this, as did the PVR in, in short term, and then next, the PVR is in three months, the first one is um, literally within hours of the use. So physiologically, it seems like there is a response. Next slide. In addition, this response was seen in um, uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure, and if you look at the six-minute walk test, 
at the end of the three months, both of them uh, show significant improvement. So here's one study that sort of hints that there may be some use of PD-5s uh, in COPD. Obviously, this is a small trial. There is more, and I'm not going to go each one of them, but just to tell you, there is, there is at least uh, hope um, that um, uh, our drugs may work. Next slide. How about ERAs? Mixed experience with the endothelial receptor antagonist. Um, Bocentan in one study caused deterioration, in other small trial um, improved exercise capacity. Next slide. And in sort of a meta-analysis of data so far, Korean meta-analysis of the data um, of um, pulmonary hypertension drugs in COPD, the result was, next slide, that overall there was no clear signal, and that's the diamond on the bottom. Now there was a signal if the um, pH was confirmed with right heart cath. And we see that a lot, because a lot of times what we think is pH actually ends up being left-sided disease, diastolic dysfunction, or fluid overload. Uh, we just don't know it, which is why it's so important, so important to do the right heart cath again and again, and there's no escaping it. And anybody who who does any trial in pH that thinks they're treating pH and doesn't do right heart cath will be punished. So, okay, so let's think about COPD. How about COPD with mild pH? Well, we just said that the experts slash center directors believe that they can classify patients with pH, group one, PAH, and still let them have COPD. And if you look at trials, many of them allowed patients with FEV1s between 60 and 80, somewhat obstructive, who had a history of smoking, but nobody actually gave them a diagnosis of COPD. So we basically implicitly agreed that patients have mild COPD and they could still be called group one. And so these people were part of the trials. Now, what we haven't done is go back and see if those were the people that brought us down, which is possible. But nevertheless, they were part of the trials. And so there may be some um, uh, logic to say that if the, P, if the COPD is very mild, that you can essentially say that you're dealing with uh, simple PAH that has an incidental mild COPD on top of it and to treat accordingly with, of course, an eye towards the COPD in case it's underestimated, especially if you end up with VQ mismatch and, and other sort of uh, strange occurrences after starting um, the drugs. Next slide. And so this is where yesterday's session in exercise physiology may be helpful. While imaging hasn't advanced that much yet, we understand exercise physiology, and it seems like our exercise physiology friends are telling us that for patients with COPD um, whose pressures are um, lower than 35, so elevated, because the mean pressure is over 25, defines pulmonary hypertension, but not really elevated, somehow their exercise is actually more limited ventilatorily than through the pulmonary vasculature. And hence, if their limitations of exercise has to do with their COPD, perhaps our drugs will not be of benefit to them. And the counter benefits of possible VQ mismatch may be a problem. Conversely, next slide, it seems that actually regardless of the severity of the COPD, if the mean pulmonary pressures go over 40, that is so significant that the circulatory defect actually takes precedence, which is why this sort of binary modality seems to have appeared, suggesting that we should go away from calling things out of proportion, that maybe there's a line in the sand as opposed to a proportionality, that if the levels are above 40, it doesn't sort of matter how bad or good the COPD is, that person is limited by their pulmonary vasculature, and at least that may be an invitation for us to try our drugs. Now that doesn't mean it may necessarily work, and that doesn't mean that necessarily there's no danger in 
creating VQ mismatch, but at least there is a more plausible benefit to trying to treat the pulmonary vasculature. Next slide. So, okay, so there's plausible benefit. What are the costs? And we said the fear somewhere in there is VQ mismatch, which is understandable. Let's say the lungs intelligently close off flow to areas that are very emphysematous or destroyed. By treating the patient, would you not disturb it? And so the Florida group, uh, Dr. Bajwa, us, and Dr. Berger and, and, and friends, we, we considered using inhaled drugs, and others have as well, and see if inhaled drugs, because they get delivered and they are more effective in functional areas of the lung, that they wouldn't really sort of solve the VQ mismatch. And it's sort of proof of concept study. We looked at patients with COPD, um, sort of standard definitions of pulmonary hypertension, uh, started them on uh, inhaled triprostanol, and looked at the effects on their ABGs, WHO classification, and uh, six-minute walk test. Next slide. And so most of them did either better uh, or slightly worse. And one person that you can see really decreased. The reason that particular person actually had a low PVR, it was that a couple of years where we took the PVR definition out of pulmonary hypertension. So that patient kind of slid in. Um, but most of the patients actually did either better or um, about the same. And so um, in part, this and other um, studies have led to um, a, a future trial of inhaled medications in, uh, uh, in, in lung disease. And so hopefully um, there may be a way to get around that VQ mismatch deal by using inhaled medications perhaps. Next slide. And you know, at the end of the day, I see this beautiful sort of distinctions of these two physiognomic types of COPD, pink puffers and blue bloaters. And to this day, nobody has distinguished these. So perhaps COPD is really a bad diagnosis. Uh, we lumped them to create a simple uh, entity, and maybe that simple entity doesn't have a right to exist. Any entity that has these two people at the same time, that are clearly two different people, maybe has not helped us. Maybe we should think about it the same way psychiatrists think about the brain. It's too complicated to call it one thing, so you have to grade it on three axes. So I'm in favor of a three-axis definition of COPD along the axis of emphysema, reactive airway, and uh, bronchitis, sputum production. And maybe if we actually think about complicated diseases, in a complicated way, it actually at least fa will facilitate correct thinking and better research. So one of our problems, one of our downfalls, every time we deal with COPD, is our failure to realize that that's a bad definition that deserves to be revised. That anything that has these two people in it that doesn't distinguish between them doesn't deserve to exist, as far as I'm concerned, in that vocabulary. Next slide, please. So, what are we going to leave you, leave us, in managing COPD patients? Well, three sets of recommendations then. Three sets of recommendations. Next, please. Number one has to do with NICE recommendations for pH treatments, which basically summarizes what we just said. Basically, the idea is that if the FEV1 is on the higher range over 60, 70%, it, they may be really actually group one. And if the patient's mean pulmonary pressures are over 35, there is at least a logical uh, claim to treat them as really group one. Still the recommendation is for them to be treated in centers where they will be studied and they become part of an experience of a center which then could be reported and could improve our knowledge and understanding. On the other hand, if the pressures are below, um, if the FEV1 is below 60%, then really only consider it if um, the mean pulmonary artery pressures are above 
35, and then use the caveats that we mentioned earlier to consider treating them still as part of research and clinical trials. If you're in that intermediary zone, should Rod really consider treatment for pulmonary hypertension? Those patients' lungs are limited by ventilatory defect and not by circulatory defect. And so you're better off paying attention to their lungs than to their pulmonary vasculature. Next slide. So number two, maximal management of underlying disease. We have multiple, multiple evidence that we never fully treat COPD patients to what they deserve. We know there is mortality benefit in pulmonary hypertension, at least in aggregate meta-analyses, underutilized oxygen. The result of lot trials will be reported soon. My guess is that they're going to suggest that patients benefit from um, oxygen levels that are higher than 89. Um, so maybe that will help everybody, including our pulmonary hypertension patients. Um, the particular genetic subtype of alpha-1 antitrypsin, which uh, deserves attention and improves mortality when treated. Vaccinations. Um, we just recently looked at the deaths of our pulmonary hypertension patients. It turns out that more than 20% of our patients die from pneumonia. And so perhaps more than anything I could do for my pulmonary hypertension patients is to make sure they're vaccinated and not let that be sort of somebody else's uh, obligation. Uh, lung volume reduction surgery, smoking station, basically sort of the whole package of treatment maximizing their COPD uh, management. Next slide. And lastly, what is called the N of 1 clinical trial, that any time you're venturing out of the area of recommendations and um, full knowledge, that you're basically uh, having a new set of responsibilities. And this is um, really to discuss the cost and benefits with the patient, more than you usually would. Uh, I do not believe the first do no harm really is an invitation to do nothing. But it is an invitation to be very careful. Um, I think it's very important to pay great attention to the patient's physiology. Think about what kind of COPD are they are. Uh, do they have any other problems? Scoliosis, any lung destruction? What do you think is going to happen to them? Uh, in usual pulmonary hypertension, just like in cancer, we give the drugs and we work through the side effects bravely. But when you're giving a medication and you're not sure if the medication is benefiting the patient, you have to be very, very sensitive to managing side effects and not overtly defend a drug when it's not clear that it's benefiting the patient. More than before, it is important to set goals ahead of time. And if you're not reaching them, to be honest with yourself and the patient and stop the drugs. Because you're basically running a clinical trial of N of 1 when you're outside the realms of um, medical knowledge, which we are in really treating patients with, uh, with COPD. Um, so my task is to talk about the treatment of pulmonary hypertension in interstitial lung disease. Let's see if I have any better luck with this. So you've seen this many times before in terms of our classification of uh, pulmonary hypertension, and I'm going to focus mostly on group 3 in interstitial lung disease, although other conditions such as sarcoidosis are included under group 5, but I'm going to focus mostly on other forms of interstitial lung disease. And much like IPAH is our prototype disease for group 1, so is IPF our prototype disease for group 3, at least with regards to the ILDs. Next slide, please. So if you look at the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in IPF, it may work. It may work. I'll try it next time. Okay. Um, it really varies. It depends when you look uh, for it. It might be as low as around 10-15% and as high as 85%. So if you look for it early, it's more in the range of 10 to 15. If you look for it late, at the time that the patients are receiving a lung transplant, it's closer to 85%. So it tends to be progressive over time. This is um, data from our own program looking at the prevalence and the distribution of PA pressures in patients with IPF as well as NSRP. There's not much literature on NSRP, but really the, the difference is not much. It seems like 
any form of interstitial lung disease, if patients have had it long enough and if they advance long enough, they're going to at some point develop pulmonary hypertension. Now, the pH of IPF, it tends to be mild, much like COPD. If you look at all those patients with a mean pH pressure greater than 25, uh, greater than 25 millimeters of mercury, about 50% of them reside in the range of 25 to 30, so very mild. And yet when you look at the impact of any, of any pH in patients with IPF, you can see a stark and marked difference in outcomes and survival, as shown in this graph over here. Now why is that? And this was an interesting question that we tried to address um, in terms of what happens. Why, why does pH impact mortality like that? And this was a study that we did where we looked at baseline right heart cath data at the time of transplant evaluation and then looked at the cath data again in the OR when they were getting transplanted but before any incisions were made. So everyone gets swanned and draped and everything. And we extracted the data and for the same cohort, there were about 40 patients, 38% of them had pH at baseline. And by the time they were in the OR under general anesthesia, where arguably you'd expect the pH pressures to be lower, 87% of them had pulmonary hypertension. So it tends to be progressive, and in some cases it's actually parabolic in terms of its development. In some of these cases, these lines over here, the right heart casts were one month apart. I have to admit, uh, when we published this paper, I shopped it around quite a bit. I think we sent it to about five different journals before it finally got accepted, so persistence is key. But one of the big um, criticisms that the, uh, that the reviewers had was that we were taking right heart cath data from the cath lab and comparing that to the OR. So what we did, and this I think um, uh, piggybacks onto Frank's talk about COPD, we did the same analysis in our COPD patients who require transplant, and what we showed is a marked similarity between the PA pressures when the, when the COPD patients were cath and when they were transplant. And generally the lag for COPD tends to be greater between the time of evaluation and transplant, but you could almost draw a straight line across. Their PA pressures didn't tend to rise as much as we see here over time. And that's, what I think, what got the paper in eventually when we produced that data. Now, pH also has implications uh, for functional ability. This is taken from the same paper that we had published in CHESS 10 years ago now, showing that those patients with pulmonary hypertension walk less and desaturate more. So this is an important clue into the presence of pulmonary hypertension. If you have patients who do a six-minute walk and they walk uh, not a very far distance and they have excessive desaturation, that might be an indicator that they have underlying pH. Uh, it's kind of a chicken-egg situation because you arguably, is it the hypoxia that's causing the pH or is it the pH that's causing the hypoxia? But it might be that the one feeds into the other in kind of a negative feedback loop. There's also data to suggest that pH results in or is associated with acute exacerbations. We've actually seen that in COPD. I think that the same relationship exists in, cy in cystic fibrosis as well. So all of these negative associations with pH kind of raises the ante in terms of should we be addressing this, should we be treating pH. Comparing, and this is recent data from the Comparer Registry which is kept out in Europe. This was published by Marius Hooper, uh, I think it was an EPUB in PLUS One in December of last year, looking at the survival of IPAH versus PHIIP. And you can see that the implication of pH in the context of idiopathic interstitial pneumonias is much more significant than what we see in RPAH. So certainly well worth addressing to see if we can impact this. What about the pathogenesis? And it's kind of complex and much like it is in COPD. We used to think that it was, we used to think very simplistically, the more fibrosis, the more interstitial lung disease you had, that there would be a very strong relationship between the degree of restriction and fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension. And I'll show you data that it, uh, shows that that's not the case. This is an analysis that, that we did publish in CHEST uh, nine years ago, I guess, where we looked at lung function by deciles, and you can see greater than 70%, 60 to 69%, et cetera, all the way down. And what you would expect with that hypothesis, if it was all related to um, interstitial lung disease and fibrosis, was a greater prevalence and higher PA pressures as you went down that decile range. But what you can see on the right hand side is that the mean PA pressures were really not dissimilar amongst all the deciles and the uh, percentage of patients was also not dissimilar if you do an analysis. But if you look 
at those patients, what's notable, if you look at those patients whose FECs were greater than 70% and compare them to those who are less than 40%, the numbers there are quite different, 29, 21, and 62% versus 36%. So this is a paradox. How do you explain this, that the, worse, the, the less restriction, the more pH and the more severe? And the only way I can explain this is that those patients with pulmonary hypertension in the context of early ILD come to clinical attention earlier, hence the higher prevalence and uh, numbers seen in the greater 70 percent. And the less than 40 percent patients is a survival effect because those patients who develop pH don't survive to, uh, to d develop severe enough restriction less than 40 percent. So they're kind of um, getting um, lost along the way as they develop more restriction in the context of, this, of their pulmonary hypertension. There's also data out of, uh, this is a work done at UCLA looking at fibrosis score on CT compared to mean PA pressure and this is pretty much a scattergram showing no relationship between the degree of fibrosis and the, and the PA pressures. This is a, a rather complex um, cartoon depiction of all the factors that may be playing a role in the genesis of pH. I don't think I'm going to mention them all, I'll just highlight a few. Uh, comorbidities, let's never forget about comorbidities and the role of things like sleep apnea, heart failure preserved ejection fraction. Certainly the fibrosis does play a role with some destruction of the vascular bed, VQ mismatching we spoke about. Um, something I'd like to focus on and mention especially is PVOD because we know from the PAH world that if patients have PVOD, that's basically a contraindication to PAH medication because you can make them worse. Well, PVOD-like lesions have been described in IPF as well. You think about the fibrosis and the scattered distribution of fibrosis in the lungs, there's bound to be some fibrosis around veins and venules giving you PVOD-like anatomy and potentially PVOD-like physiology and pathophysiology. So that's a cautionary note to treating patients with ILD with our vasoactive agents. Not to say we shouldn't, and I'll get to that as I get towards the end of the talk, but if patients get worse, think about PVOD as a potential reason why. So when should we suspect pulmonary hypertension in interstitial lung disease? I think there are many steps along the way that can raise your level of suspicion. Certainly history, shortness of breath, that appears disproportionate to the patient's underlying parenchymal lung disease. Always listen for that loud P2. If they have developed signs of right heart failure, it's usually very late in the disease course, and in my experience, IPF patients will usually die before they develop flagrant right heart failure. It's very rare to see that. Um, the lower the DL, the more likely it is that they have a component of pulmonary hypertension. And at least from the scleroderma literature, you can look at the FEC to DL ratio as an indicator of increased vascular involvement. The six-minute walk I spoke about already, uh, look at desaturation, distance, and also the pulse rate recovery, which is something that has been shown to correlate with pulmonary hypertension and to, pe to perhaps be the best predictor of outcomes in patients with IPF in terms of the six-minute walk. It's an easy calculation. You look at the pulse rate at the end of the study, or the six-minute walk, say it's 20, 120 rather, you wait one minute into recovery and it's 100, then your pulse rate recovery is 20. The lower the pulse rate recovery, the worse the prognosis, and the more likely it is that the patient has pulmonary hypertension. You can use our, our standard biomarkers to get an idea if there's pulmonary hypertension and certainly heart failure as well with the NT Pro BMP. And ECHO is a very good screening tool, but as Frank alluded to, it's not a diagnostic test, and if you want to make the diagnosis, you always need a right heart cath. Um, this is a CT of a patient with IPF, and whenever we look at a CT, we not, not only look at the parenchyma, but we also look at the mediastinum. And what you'll notice over here is that the PA is rather large, and you can compare this to the diameter of the aorta, and if it's greater than one, then this might indicate underlying pulmonary hypertension. We have a, a study, it's not in press anymore, it's an EPUB in the ERJ, looking at this ratio as an indicator of outcomes, and this was an independent indicator of survival in patients with IPF, just looking at the PA to A ratio. So something we can all do in our standard HRCTs that we get in patients with ILD. Now ECHO tends to overestimate, but it can also even underestimate what the true PA pressures are. So in, in many cases it's inaccurate, it only gives you the PA systolic pressure, doesn't give you the mean PA pressure and none of the other indices. So just to underscore the point again that you always need a right heart cath. 
So let's summarize what we know. We know that pH commonly complicates the course of interstitial lung disease. It's associated with worse survival, reduced functional status, possibly acute exacerbations. What we think we know is the etiology. We know how to diagnose pH. But what we don't know is whether pH is the driver of outcomes or if it's a surrogate of other badness going on in the lungs. And we don't like the term disproportionate pulmonary hypertension, but we still all talk about disproportionate pulmonary hypertension, and we don't know what that is. What we don't know, but shouldn't be too scared to ask, is should we treat pH? If we do, does it affect patients' functional status? What's the impact on survival, and are we doing more harm than good? You can also possibly have discordant outcomes. You can have improved functional ability and reduced survival, or improved survival and reduced functional ability. We've seen that in the heart failure literature with the use of, of inotropes. So that's just a, another word of caution as we try and work our way through these studies. So let's move on to treatment, which um, is really the focus of, of what I've been tasked with today. Um, the low-hanging fruit, treat the underlying condition. Not to say that the antifibrotics or any other medications for interstitial lung disease are going to affect the pH, um, but nonetheless we should treat the underlying condition anyway. Comorbidities, especially important because we're dealing with an elderly population in IPF, and the, the prevalence of um, diastolic heart failure or HFPF is in the range of around 10 to 20 percent. So if people, if folks are reticent to get a right heart cath, I always say, well, gosh, maybe the wedge will be 22. We can give them some Lasix and they'll do better. So it's well worthwhile if you're going to impact 10 to 20 percent of your patients. Uh, look out for desaturations. OSA patients with IPF in particular have a very high prevalence of OSA, and they tend to have a higher predisposition for thromboembolic events as well. So I'm sure you've seen this through the uh, course of this conference, but these are all the drugs that are approved. I have them nicely color-coded for you in terms of class or pathway that they affect. And here we have them most recently up to 2016. So all these different drugs, 10 different compounds, 13 different modalities of treating pulmonary hypertension, at least in the US. And the more drugs we have to play with, the more tempting it becomes to take them beyond group one into group three. We only have one drug approved beyond group one, and that's rear cigarette, that's approved for CTEF. So we're kind of busting at the seams in terms of trying these drugs in other forms of pulmonary hypertension. Now, I've showed you the slide already in terms of if you treat something that's associated, it's only associated with worse survival, can you affect outcomes? And here I'll give you two hypothetical patients, Mr. Orange Dot and Mr. Green Dot, and the question is, can we keep Mr. Green Dot on the green line and bring Mr. Orange up to the green line and affect his prognosis? It sounds very attractive, seductively appealing, we all want to do that. Word of caution here, this was a study looking at serum albumin as an indicator of outcomes in IPF. This was uh, from Dave Ziesman when he was at UCLA, showing that those patients with the lowest serum albumins have the worst outcomes. And the reason I show this in parallel is because I don't think anyone in the audience believes that if we give IV albumin infusions, we're going to affect the outcome of patients with IPF. So caveats to empiric therapy. You heard about worsening oxygenation, VQ mismatch, PVOD I mentioned. And you might be dealing with patients who have occult heart failure, in which case you might potentially make them worse as well. Okay, I, um, that's, that's the con argument. Now I'm going to give the pro argument. I, I enjoy arguing with myself because I can't lose. <laughs> so now, now's the pro. Well, this is a lung biopsy of a patient with IPF. You can see a lot of subpleural fibrosis. You can see uh, blood vessels that are obliterated and fibrotic. And I don't think any of us believes that we're going to impact these vessels with our medications. But if you look at areas that are relatively, relatively well preserved, which, is, which characterizes IPF, there's also vascular pathic changes there. And the parallel is to CTEF, where we don't treat the mechanical obstruction or the strictures or the bands, but we treat the small vessel vasculopathy that it tends to occur in other areas of the quote-unquote normal lung these patients will develop a small vessel vasculopathy. So can we impact these vessels rather than those obliterated fibrotic vessels? The STEP IPF was a study that I think provides somewhat of a proof of concept. For those of you who might recall, STEP IPF was a study done by the NIH IPF network in um, patients with IPF whose DLCOs were less than 35% of predicted. So enriched for patients who probably had pulmonary hypertension, or many cases had pulmonary hypertension. 
The primary endpoint was a 20% increase in the six-minute walk distance, and on this basis, the study failed. 10% in the treatment arm versus 7% in the placebo arm, and so this was a negative study by its primary endpoint. However, if you look at a bunch of the secondary endpoints, there were a bunch of things that were positive. Quality of life, DLCO, oxygenation, were all positive, suggesting that there was some kind of treatment effect, and even mortality came tantalizingly close to being statistically significant, albeit the numbers were, were quite small. A subsequent subgroup analysis, which I'm not going to show today, looked at those patients from step IPF who had any evidence on echo of RV dysfunction. And when you look at that very small subgroup, there was indeed a benefit from treating with sildenafil with a difference in the walk distance of around 90 or 100 meters. And as we kind of grapple with this concept of who to treat or who to study, it might be that when supervening RV dysfunction comes along, that's when that, that patient would be uh, a suitable uh, patient for targeted therapy. We know that RV dysfunction drives outcomes in PAH, and the same might hold true if RV dysfunction supervenes in ILD and in COPD for that matter as well. Um, this is a study of rear cigarette, was done by Marius Hooper in Europe. This was also a study that suggested benefit. Here are some of the results here. Hemodynamic improvement, six minute walk test, um, also improved by around 25 meters. This was a short term study over around 12 weeks. Um, this was a study done by the Sega brothers at UCLA looking at treprostanol, parenteral treprostanol in those patients with severe pH as per our de definition, greater than 35 millimeters of mercury. And this also appeared to be a positive study. I'll show you some of the salient results. Echo parameters improved, um, six minute walk improved by numbers. You can see the number of patients who improved by more than 57 meters and there were very few patients who had any kind of decline. The point being that if you choose your patients correctly, maybe we can get a positive study. This was a prospective study, but it was an open-label study. A more sobering study was this study by Santin in pH associated with fibrotic interstitial pneumonias. This was from Athel Wells's group, and a bunch of, it was actually a multi-center study. This was published in the Blue Journal, and I like the study because it was a totally negative study. Not that I like negative studies, but I like the fact that the Blue Journal chose to publish a negative study, which I think is a good thing. They chose a hemodynamic endpoint in terms of the PVR, and there was no difference. You can see that the graphs look replicate. If you look at all the secondary endpoints, there wasn't even a signal of anything positive. And I mean, this is like getting a Chem 23 and finding out everything's normal. How often does that happen? You would expect there to be at least one that approached statistical significance. So this was outright a negative study. Um, the Compara registry, which is a registry of patients with pH that are on therapy out of Europe, has produced some interesting data, and this was a publication uh, in uh, December of last year, looking specifically at the IIP population from Compara, showing what happens in the trenches, at least in, in Europe, many of these patients are actually treated. Many of these patients, surprisingly, had more severe pulmonary hypertension. Most of them, I believe, had uh, mean PA pressures greater than 35 millimeters of mercury. And these are the results that they achieved in those patients who were treated, and they're almost comparable to what the results were in the IPAH population. If you make your way down and see those who improved more than 20 meters, 30 meters, 40 meters, actually quite similar, which is uh, remarkably surprising, I would say. Also, from the same study, they looked at those patients who had a treatment response, which they def defined as a change in the distance between uh, the start of therapy and the next visit of around 20 meters, or improvement in their functional class. And if patients responded to therapy, there did appear to be a survival benefit as well. Um, this was another um, re uh, fairly recent study that was published. This was kind of a, a hodgepodge of patients. Sorry. Um, this included both fibrotic patients as well as obstructive uh, disease patients who were, uh, who were placed on targeted therapy compared to those who weren't placed on targeted therapy, showing a big difference in outcomes in terms of survival. Once again, this was a mix of group three patients. So more evidence to suggest that if you pick the right patients, maybe we can impact on patients' disease course. 
So how to get the study right? And the, the, the two very important components to getting the study right, because that's really what we need to do, we need to do more studies, is finding the right patient phenotype, be it in COPD, ILD, IPF, and coming up with the right endpoints. How do we define response to therapy? How do we grapple with that balance between permissible, the permissible amount of parenchymal lung disease versus how much severity of pulmonary vascular disease do we need? At the same time, we don't want to make the study too restrictive that we can't enroll it. So we have to cast a wide net in order to enroll a study such as this. If you look at all the various studies um, that have been done in PAH, you can, the, the distribution of patients who are recruited is very akin to this. RPH around 60%, maybe two-thirds. Most of the rest are CTD patients and then a smattering of the congenital hearts and the portopulmonary patients. If you look at the prevalence of ILD, it's actually quite similar. IPF is the most common. Then we have NSIP, uh, undifferentiated, um, uh, comes next. And then you have the rest, the more rare conditions, RBILD, uh, ARP, COP, etc. So the parallels exist between ILD, IIP, and what we've done in PAH. So when we do studies of PH therapies in ILD, we shouldn't just restrict it to IPF, it's going to be very exclusive and difficult to recruit. We've seen that, been there, done that. We should probably extend it beyond to include all the IIPs and perhaps even take it a step beyond and go after things like chronic HP and the pneumoconioses. Chronic HP in particular can be very difficult to differentiate from IIP, so why care about it if they have pH and fibrotic disease? Okay, more to build on that case. Um, this is data that uh, is taken from over 10 years ago, looking at patients with NSIP. Once their DL gets to less than 35%, their prognosis becomes the same as patients with UIP. Once the DL gets to less than 35%, high likelihood that they have pH. So the hypothesis is that it's not the ILD that's driving outcomes, but rather the pH that's driving outcomes. And then this is a very similar study in patients with um, unclassifiable ILD. And if, these studies were 10 years apart, but if you look at the three-year survival between these two studies, unclassifiable, NSIP, UIP, they're remarkably, diff, uh, remarkably similar. So these diseases will behave the same at some point in their disease course, so why not study them all together with our pH therapies? This is a concept cartoon looking at this in terms of progression of the interstitial lung disease, and is there some kind of an inflection point where the pulmonary hypertension becomes the driver of outcomes and functional ability? This is data uh, points from our own patient population looking at the mean PA pressure versus the FVC, 178 patients, 32% of them in this particular group happen to have pH. So where do we set the threshold? Do we set it at severe pH in terms of trying to recruit these studies, in which case we're eliminating many patients with pulmonary hypertension who might benefit and make the study at the same time more difficult to recruit. And then where do we set the FVC bar? Do we set it at 50% and then we have even fewer patients who we can recruit into the study? Or do we take it down to 25? The advantage of that is maybe we're going to have some patients who might not respond as well, but we'll have more patients in the study and potentially more patients that we can apply the therapy to if we show that it works. This is my attempt to, to get fancy with this. This is uh, the concept of a rolling threshold based on individual patients and what their FVC and, and mean PA pressure are. So I call this Steve's crazy rule of 100. Uh, 75 plus 25 is 100. So if their FVC is 75%, they need to have a, a, a mean PA pressure of at least 25. If the FVC is 50, more restrictive, then they need to have a mean PA pressure of at least 50. So a very simple concept, and it's not going to pan out like this, trust me, but just to the idea of maybe we need to think more innovatively how we approach these patients. So choosing the best endpoint, we, think we have to think about what pH affects, because choosing the patient population, the right phenotype is the first step, getting the endpoints right is equally important. So what does pH affect in the context of ILD? Survival, we know, functional status we know, at least there's an association, functional class, quality of life certainly, possibly AEs, hospitalization, yes, transplantation possibly, and um, so th this is our choice 
of endpoints when we institute these clinical trials. We are doing one such study, just to put a plug in for the RISE IRP study. This is a study of rear ciguate in any form of interstitial pneumonia. So going with my concept of keeping it broad, the mean PA pressure criteria is greater than 25. We are pretty liberal with our FEC. We say that anyone with an FEC greater than 45 can get into the study. And there are a bunch of usual secondary criteria um, and exclusionary criteria as well. But we try to keep it as broad as possible. And I'll give you some information on how the study is going. It's going actually very well. Hopefully, we're going to finish recruitment in the next couple of months. It's going to be probably be about 125 patients in the study. Um, the primary endpoint is going to be the six-minute walk. This is a phase two study. It's going to hopefully inform a phase three program. And what we focused on a lot is what is going to be our other endpoint, which might become the primary if we move on to a phase three study. So our other endpoint is shown here. This is a composite endpoint of clinical worsening, and what we chose as the four composites were a change in the walk distance of 15% on the downside, uh, hospitalization for cardiopulmonary worsening, death, and then the fourth component is change in New York Heart Association functional class. So hopefully this uh, composite endpoint will perform well in this phase two study. We're presenting data on the study at ATS. It's going to be the baseline characteristics of the first 100 patients enrolled. But I think this is probably going to be the most robust study that has been done, certainly in interstitial lung disease. And I, I feel cautiously optimistic that we're going to learn a lot from this study. It's actually this, uh, I'm fortunate enough to be the, the, the principal investigator for the study. It's kind of blossomed, and we have many different countries and centers around the world involved now. So be on the lookout for RISE IRP because hopefully that's going to be the first stepping stone on our way to finding effective therapies to treat the pH of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. So I'll stop there with six seconds to spare. That's all I have. Thank you for your attention.